Professor Easterlin, when you were um, involved in the writing of your article on the American baby boom in historical perspective, what kind of intellectual currents, what kind of issues were prominent at that time? And, and uh, what kind of topics were you thinking about that led you into this line of research? Well, it grew out of my work on a project with Simon Kuznets and Dorothy Thomas. That was sort of my first involvement in uh, demographic work. And Kuznets and Thomas had a project that involved the uh, uh, analysis of interrelations between uh, population change in the United States over uh, the period since 1870, in, uh, with primary emphasis on internal migration and, uh, and economic change. I came into the project uh, under Kuznets' uh, tutelage uh, and was mainly involved in economic estimates, but uh, as a result of the exposure, I got interested in demography. And after I finished that project, I went on to another uh, related line of work that came out of that and other work of Kuznets, which had to do with long swings in uh, the economic growth of the United States. And I was interested particularly in the demographic aspects. And, uh, the, uh, of course, the striking uh, feature at the time, which was the 1950s, was uh, you know, our enormous baby boom. And the question uh, that naturally posed itself was whether the baby boom uh, had some historic relation to earlier swings in population that had been largely migration type swings. And so it, w it was that, uh, that background that led to my inquiry. Unlike uh, the situation uh, uh, in economics today, uh, that there was more, there, there was more, somewhat more attention to to, uh, to think questions like the baby boom. Uh, the president uh, of the Population Association, uh, Owen, the, one of the presidents in the 1950s, had written an article, uh, Joseph S. Davis, that uh, directed a lot of attention to the baby boom and speculated about the reasons. So that was uh, it related. It helped to relate the subject more to the profession although it's still true that, by and large, economists didn't pay too much attention to uh, population change, and especially fertility. Okay. Uh, when you were working on the paper and in the process of, of uh, coming up with your ideas about, about the interaction between cohort size and economic uh, experiences that people had, were you in contact with any particular other people? Were there people who were particularly instrumental in helping you to think about these things? Were there graduate students, other colleagues? What sort of context was this for you? In, uh, in this particular case, most of the, the uh, influence came from my contacts uh, with people in demography. Uh, Kuznets was the, was, the, was the big stimulus uh, in terms of, uh, of, of looking at population change and longer term swings in population change. But most of the, of the substantive knowledge and, and ideas about cohorts uh, uh, came out of demography. The, the, the cohort approach was uh, at the time a, a new, was an innovation in demographic analysis. So it was getting a fair amount of attention. And uh, I think it was uh, that type of, that strain of work uh, that got me interested. Was it from reading those types of articles, or were you in talking yeah. directly with some of these people? Par partly reading, uh, partly uh, go uh, attending conferences. The people that were doing the, sort of the pioneering work were, uh, from my point of view at that time, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the uh, top people in the field, like uh, P.K. Welton, uh, and uh, uh, I didn't have any uh, personal uh, contact with them. but. Uh, I read their books very carefully, and, uh, and it was from that that I really learned. So the, the uh, publication of, of works sometimes has a direct impact on other people and their work. Yeah, well, uh, it, it was. 
I have had no formal training in demography, so most of what, you know, and never have, and most of what I've learned uh, was uh, by virtue of sort of Dorothy Thomas saying, you ought to read so-and-so. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, she did a lot. Uh, I mean, I owed, owed a lot to Kuznets in terms of intellectual uh, and methodological views, but uh, Dorothy was a, a great influence in terms of, uh, of interdisciplinary uh, uh, feeling. In my original draft of the Baby Boom uh, article, uh, I sort of was putting down demographers and, you know, I guess sort of being uh, an arrogant economist and saying how <laughs> I knew all the answers, you know. And she said, uh, she looked at it, she said, yeah, this is a pretty good article, she said, but uh, why are you why are you being so negative about all these people? Because you were, you really uh, benefited uh, enormously from their work, and you know then when I thought about it, it, it was obviously the case. And so, I changed very much the tone uh, of, of the article, and you know I, I really acknowledged uh, the debt uh, that I owed to these prior uh, scholars in demography and. Uh, I owe that very much to Dorothy's just sort of, you know, making me much more tolerant and uh, aware of, uh, of, the, of what I how much I benefited from other fields. That's, that's a, her reputation. Yeah. Uh, since the article came out, you've done a number of other things to follow up and expand on these ideas, including the, uh, the book Birth and Fortune, which has reached a, a quite large number of people. Uh, what sort of reactions have you had to these ideas since you put them out into the public domain, and how do you think it's influenced the discipline? Well, uh, the, uh, let, let me add one other historic thing uh, uh, about the evolution of birth and fortune. Uh, toward the, toward the, uh, uh, in the early baby boom article, I, w I predicted on the basis of my analysis that fertility would turn down, and indeed, it did. Uh, and uh, as I pursued that line of analysis much more, uh, I, uh, I came to realize that, uh, uh, that the approach that I followed, which typically came you know, out of pure economics and uh, always assumed taste didn't change, uh, was, uh, was not very uh, uh, helpful. Uh, and so uh, the sociological literature and emphasizing how people form their aspirations as a result of growing up uh, uh, started to play a more important part in my interpretation as I reached sort of the latter part of uh, the book on uh, the baby boom and as I moved on to, to the analysis of birth and fortune. So, uh, I had learned somewhat, uh, it, it was a further impact of, you know, another field on my thinking uh, that uh, uh, was reflected in, uh, in Birth and Fortune uh, much more clearly. The, uh, uh, by and large, I think uh, most uh, baby boomers, when they, uh, when they, <coughs> when they hear the article of Birth, uh, the argument of Birth and Fortune uh, are quite uh, responsive to it and uh, uh, and identify with it. Um, so uh, in terms of popular reception, it's, uh, the, I think uh, the general reception has been good. Uh, the professional uh, reaction, I think, uh, in economics has been uh, more skeptical uh, because uh, most economists approach uh, this question the way I had done uh, 25 years earlier, so thinking taste didn't change, and since taste in, the, in my analysis are a, a function of uh, the state of the economy, uh, economists tend to be a little uh, uh, reserved. So the, the reaction in the profession was, uh, yes, the impact of cohort size on the labor market, uh, that's okay. Uh, because that's just supply influences uh, and its impact on wages and unemployment rates. But the implications of that for fertility behavior and other sorts of social uh, behavior, uh, where aspirations are brought in and relative income becomes a critical causal factor, uh, there's been a much more reserved reaction by economists. 
By demographers, I think uh, there's been uh, somewhat more uh, agreement with that since demographers come more out of the discipline of sociology, and they, they've been somewhat more accepting. Uh, but in terms of my forecast that fertility would go up, uh, I think uh, economists and demographers uh, fairly uh, persistently uh, resisted that uh, implication of the analysis. The, in addition to this sort of uh, purely demographic cyclic phenomenon, um, Birth and Fortune also makes mention of, of a lot of other related social trends and phenomena that may also be sensitive to the same sort of cyclic fluctuations, things like suicide rates and crime and all kinds of things of that sort. And now there are people beginning to appear in the political science journals discussing this uh, and in psychology journals. Do you have any uh, feeling of, uh, about how this is going, this debate on some of these other points? And I guess the answer is uh, it's uh, it, it's much like the fertility issue. Uh, there, uh, there, there is some uh, sort of uh, hesitant uh, 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 acceptance of the of the argument that uh, I'm giving. Uh, that I give. Uh, there's also a tendency to resist it fairly strenuously and turn to other factors. Uh, I view the sort of commonality of, uh, of, of developments across the spectrum you mentioned as, uh, as basically uh, uh, confirming sort of the, the fact that uh, uh, this type of, uh, of redirection of behavior would occur uh, as uh, smaller cohorts have come in. Uh, what I think was uh, uh, was a shortcoming of uh, birth and fortune uh, was uh, the failure to recognize that uh, because of the of the protracted succession of the baby boom cohorts over uh, a 20-year period, a certain saturation effect takes place in the labor market, and it takes time for that to wear off, so that uh, the uh, the, the turnaround uh, has, been, uh, has been slower than I anticipated because of the saturation effect, uh, but I feel that it's going on now. Kind of crowding down at that large number. That's right, exactly. Age group. Yeah. And I, I, it's something that, it, you know, there was some uh, discussion in the literature, uh, some, yeah, some awareness that I really uh, just didn't respond to. Thank you very much. Okay, my pleasure, Woody.